hear a conversation between a psychiatrist in the medical centre of the college and a new student. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to four. Hello, sit down, please. Thank you. Now you are a new patient, aren't you?、Y、yes, that's right. Okay, so I'd better get some basic details down first. Right, we'll start with your name. Martin Hansen. Do you spell that S O N or S E N? H A N S E N. Okay, and you're a first year student. Yes, I am. Study in、uh, electronics, actually. Ah, I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And your address? Two eight o five Hesperian Avenue, Hayward. Two eight o five and Hesperian. Yes, that's H E S P E R I A N, Hayward, H A Y W A R D. And your phone number? Seven three four two four six five five. Seven three four two six four five five. No, you got the six and the four the wrong way round. It's two four six five five. Huh? Sorry. Right. And、um, when were you born? Ah,、uh, the fifteenth of June, nineteen eighty-six. Here in New Zealand? No, I was born in Sydney. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to ten. Good. So, what's your problem? Well. Frankly, I wonder whether it is a problem. I get the blues, and it lasts for quite a while. I don't know how to. Yes, we all feel sad or get the blues now and again. Generally, our sadness lessens in time, and with the support of friends. However, if the depression leads to difficulty in thinking and greatly disrupts your daily routine, it can be evidence of a psychiatric problem. What do you feel exactly? I always feel sad and worthless. I find it hard to fall asleep and wake up early in the morning. How long has it lasted? Nearly half a month. Do you feel fatigue or loss of energy, or you may have lost interest or pleasure in usual activities? Yes, sometimes. At first, I thought I could overcome it by myself, but I failed. And、I'm so glad that you came here. It seems that you are suffering mild depression from your symptoms. Depression? Yes, I feel depressed sometimes. But why would I? Depression may occur as a result of biochemical changes in the body. Alcohol, amphetamines, cocaine, and LSD can bring on depression. Those who have a family history of depression usually have a greater risk of depression. Sometimes the worrying changes in life can lead to depression. I see. I had a really bad breakup of a love relationship. It makes me feel hopeless. Do you think I need some treatment? Yes. Antidepressant medications are often used to treat depression if it is serious. But I don't suggest them at first because of the side effects. I suggest psychotherapy, which can give you support and help you regain control. So, do I need to come here every day? No, I will arrange counselling sessions for you, which will last twelve to twenty weeks. You come here once or twice each week. The psychotherapy is directed at helping you gain insight and understanding about events in your life, which may have contributed to your depression. With growing insight, you can often learn more effective ways of coping with your feelings and changing your behaviour. What can I do to take care of myself? Well, at first you should do some physical exercises on a regular basis, at least three times a week. How is your food? Do you eat well?、Mm, yes, I think so. I eat at my homestay family. Good. 
Find a hobby or a positive recreational activity to participate in once or twice a week. I know it's difficult for you, though. When you feel it's hard to overcome the depression, come to the counseling session. Remember, ask for help if the load is too heavy to handle. Yes, I'll try. So, when will my counseling session begin? I'm going to arrange that for you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions eleven to twenty. You now have some time to read questions eleven to twenty first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university. So make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area the place for returned books and other items is at the end of the circulation desk, near Closed Reserve. Closed Reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on Closed Reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level 2 only. On level 2 are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the audio-visual resource centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audio Visual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone. And there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. 
If you need help using the catalogues, or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will now hear a radio talk on agricultural regulations. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Could there be clearer proof of the arrogance and indifference of those who are supposed to keep our food safe than the muzzling of John Verrill? Agriculture is a business, true, and businesses have to make money. But this shows how ministers and officials put the profits of the agriculture business before the well-being of the British people. Mr Verrill a pharmaceutical chemist, was appointed to represent consumers on one of the many committees that advise the government on food safety. When he tried to do his job, though, and wanted to warn ministers of a danger to children's health, he was refused permission to do so. The danger comes from hormones given to cattle in the USA and some other countries to make them grow faster. They speed up the animal's development to maturity, thus making meat production more profitable. There have, however, long been fears that the hormones have horrendous effects on the people who eat them, causing diseases as serious as cancer. Once these hormones were used on British cattle too, but over 20 years ago they were banned in Europe for being too dangerous. Indeed, so concerned is the European Union that it banned imports of hormone-fed beef years ago, much to the fury of the US government, which wants to sell it all over the world. Several years ago, the USA and Canada asked the World Trade Organization to declare the ban illegal and to punish Europe for failing to lift it. The WTO, with its long record of refusing to let environmental or safety concerns interfere with trade, agreed imposing fines of more than $120 million a year on the EU for its refusal to back down. The British government now backs the Americans, claiming that there is no proof that hormone-fed beef does any harm. This is where Mr Verrill comes in. He is very angry with the government, especially as their claim comes out just after a Danish study shows that growth hormones are 200 times more dangerous than was previously thought. Worried by these findings, Mr Verrill spoke to government representatives, who did nothing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. 
Not only that, but they have not been testing beef which is imported, which, by law, they are required to do. This directly affects the British public, as about 40% of the beef British people eat comes from abroad, supposedly from countries like Brazil, which does not allow the use of growth hormones. Brazilian beef is stocked by some British supermarkets and widely used in catering. Yet, when a Brazilian farm was recently visited by EU inspectors, a large stockpile of this banned substance was found. This is not the first food scandal we have had in our country. Take the present concern over a well known chocolate company. Several months ago, the company found out that its sweets were contaminated with a rare form of salmonella, but they did nothing about it, leaving their sweets in the shops to be bought by the unsuspecting public. It was not until five months later, when several children had suffered food poisoning, that the chocolate bars were removed from the shelves. It makes you wonder how many other dangerous foods have been allowed onto our plates. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on coral reef. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the lecture and answer questions 31 to 40. Do you fancy diving in the wonderful world of coral reefs, green sponges, colourful fish and red crabs? It is a rich garden beneath the waves. But how much do you know about the corals? Are they animals or plants? What are the threats to coral reefs? Today, Mr Tim Harford, Executive Director of the Coral Reef Alliance, is going to introduce the facts about coral reefs. Good afternoon, everyone. Coral reefs are one of nature's most magnificent creations. It is filled with thousands of unique and valuable plants and animals. Over one quarter of all marine species depend on healthy coral reefs. Humans also depend on coral reefs. These marine ecosystems are the primary source of food and income for millions of people, a vast repository of valuable chemical compounds and medicines, and a natural wave barrier that protect beaches and coastlines from waves and storms. Coral is actually the exoskeletons of coral polyps. Made from limestone, these skeletons build up over time, forming the reef. New corals are born each April. At a certain hour, on a certain night, mature corals suddenly release clouds of eggs and sperm into the sea. After the fertilised eggs take root on the seafloor, they can grow up to 15 centimetres per year. Coral reefs are present in the waters of over 100 countries. These are warm, 18 to 29 degrees centigrade, shallow, sunny regions primarily between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. Only clear, warm salt water can support a coral reef. And because sunlight is crucial to the reef's survival, the water must also be shallow. The algae that grow on coral provide much of the coral's food. In deeper water, algae cannot get the sunlight they need to grow. Most coral reefs are in the tropics because natural conditions there are perfect. In their modern form, Coral reefs have thrived on Earth for over 50 million years. 
In recent years, however, more than 11% of the world's reefs have been lost, with another 16% severely damaged during the El Nino event in 1998. Up to 32% of coral reefs may be destroyed by human activities in the next 30 years if we do not take action now. Corals and coral reefs are extremely sensitive. Slight changes in the reef environment may have detrimental effects on the health of entire coral colonies. These changes may be due to a variety of factors. One of the greatest threats to coral reefs is human expansion or development. As human population increases, so does the harvest of resources from the sea. Due to overfishing, reef fish populations have been greatly decreased in some areas of the world. The removal of large numbers of reef fish has caused the coral reef ecosystems to become unbalanced. As we know, corals are also very popular as decorations. A large amount of the most healthy corals are selected by commercial collectors. They sell the corals to souvenir shops, where a large number of tourists wait to purchase them as decorations or souvenirs. Coral reefs also receive much damage from both commercial and private vessels. The leakage of fuels into the water and the occurrence of spills by large tankers are extremely damaging to local corals. Although much of the coral reef's degradation is directly blamed on human impact, there are several natural disturbances which cause significant damage to coral reefs. The most recognized of these events are hurricanes or typhoons, which bring powerful waves to the tropics. These storm waves cause large corals to break apart and scatter fragments about the reefs. Home to a diverse community of creatures, coral reefs are underwater treasure chests of color and activity. Predators and prey swim and crawl among the coral in nature's never-ending dance of life and death. This lively, fascinating world beneath the waves is just waiting to be explored. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.